many thanks to Becca Ballant, um, the majority leader in the Senate, come on up, and uh, Jim Harrison, who's um, uh, in the House now and is a long time head of the Vermont Grocers and Retailers Association. So very pleased that both of you could be with us today. And we are going to be passing the mic back and forth because um, otherwise it can be hard to hear. We tried projecting without the mic and that didn't work so well. So, um, And uh, we have a number of questions from uh, readers and and I have to say, readers ask the best questions. I mean, they're amazing questions. So I think we can get quite deep on the nuances of this topic in the short period of time we have in front of us. I don't know if you each want to say something super brief about your general stance on minimum wage, and then we can dive right into questions if you like. Jim? Sure. Thank you, Ann, and thank you folks for coming out early this morning. Um, pleased to be here. As Ann mentioned, I'm Jim Harrison. I do have a past. Uh, please don't hold that against me. Um, I, I do try in my new role in life that now my third year, uh, third, uh, second session of being a legislator, I do try to look at things with a very open mind. I recognize my role here is to represent the constituents of my four towns, which are Bridgewater, Killington, Menden, in my hometown of Chittenden. So I'm very pleased to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Um, in terms of preconceived notions, I'm, I'm here to learn what Senator Ballant has to say um, and, and we'll take it from there. But I, I don't always come at it from a um, government knows best um, uh, perspective, but on, on the other hand, I try to be very pragmatic. Good morning. It's always fun to share the stage with Jim because he and I have a, a nice relationship. We spent many years together talking about issues in the Economic Development Committee on the Senate side when you would come in to testify. So. He just liked the treats that I brought. He did. He brought great donuts. It's true. Um, so along with, I believe at this point, 15 other senators, um, I am a co-sponsor of the minimum wage bill, so that gives you some idea where I stand on this issue. Someone who worked multiple minimum wage jobs throughout my uh, adulthood, and as someone who comes from a family that has worked restaurant jobs and tipped, tipped wage jobs uh, for many years, I have a particular lens. Um, and like Jim, I like to talk about the nuance of the conversation, so I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from the questions this morning. So happy for the invitation. Great, thank you both. Um, so the questions uh, are really from a range of points of view. And uh, some people would appear from the questions to be very uh, anxious about the implications of, the, of an increase in the minimum wage. And other people uh, wonder why it's taken the legislature so long to get there. So um, in, that spirit, in that spirit, I have a general question at the beginning. Um, you know, many employers are already paying well above minimum wage in order to attract workers. Is a minimum wage rate really necessary? Um, who is really paying minimum wage at this time? Um, and so that's my sort of overarching question, and we'll dive into um, reader questions. Jim? Well, first of all, um, as we are all well aware, um, we have a shortage in our workforce. Uh, there, are, if, if I heard anything from both small and large businesses uh, this past year is we cannot find enough good employees. Um, the positive side of that is it, the marketplace uh, reacts to it and uh, wages are going up and I think that's all good. Um, we just have to be careful when we mandate those increases too high um, and what happens to all wages, which therefore um, puts a lot of squeeze on the business owner and prices that they need to charge to stay in business. So um, it, there, is, uh, there is definitely a shortage and I think, the, as I said, the positive thing on that is the marketplace is uh, increasing wages right now. That's good. So I don't disagree with Jim that we have a worker shortage. It's something that really 
w was the issue, one of the two issues that compelled me to run for the legislature to begin with, which was looking at the crisis of workforce in my county, Wyndham County, and also looking at the growing rates of poverty. We don't disagree on that. We have a workforce crisis. What we do disagree on is, are we paying people currently what they're worth in the marketplace? And so when you look at who's benefited over the last 10 to 20 years, so since 1979, wages have been flat for those at the lower wage, lower wage earners and middle wage earners, completely flat. 99% of Vermont workers have not seen a significant raise in their wages since 1979. So although I understand that this is going to be a challenge for many businesses, we know that um, most 90% uh, of our businesses here in Vermont employ um, workers, um, have 20 workers or fewer in their um, places of employment, but a third of the workforce works for those employers. So you've got two thirds of employees working for businesses that are larger than that. And we need to be thinking about what are the workers worth? Product productivity has risen dramatically in the last 20 years, but we have not seen increases in wages. And if you are making minimum wage in Vermont, you're still making a poverty wage. So what class of company actually pays minimum wage at this point? I mean, is it just Walmart or are there other companies in Vermont that a majority of which are paying minimum wage? Is it farm workers? Or do, do we know anything about the sectors that are actually paying minimum wage at this point? Uh, that's a good question. And, um, you know, in looking at the Department of Labor website and all the data that they have on there, uh, there is um, a number of industries that probably have a higher number of low paying jobs, uh, certainly retail, uh, and, the, um, and, and a lot of that's because it's a, a lot of part-time employees when you're seven days a week, uh, uh, open long hours, uh, you have a lot of part-time and you have a lot of ebbs and flows in the business. Uh, hospitality industry, uh, which are often uh, gratuity based uh, in addition to uh, wages. So the wage itself might be low, but uh, gratuities hopefully bring that up to a more respectable number. So there are a lot of um, you know, service sector jobs, um, but it's not just that. Um, you know, the, what sometimes we don't look at is, you know, I went last week to a meeting on early, you know, daycare, early childhood um, education and whatnot. I was surprised to learn that, you know, one daycare center, uh, the average wage or the starting wage maybe uh, was like 12 dollars um, which really doesn't um, sound very high for the type of people you're trying to attract there. Um, and they would love to pay 15. Um, however, uh, they also indicated that it was going to mean that they're I'm going to get the numbers wrong. I do. I the, the latter one. I do have right that the the cost, the price they need to charge the parents was going to go up from say 250 a week to 400 a week, uh, and could they afford that? That's something we all have to do. And the answer isn't always well. The government will just pay more because the government can only get money from the taxpayers. So we have to be very careful in terms of the balance and what that means. But um, it, it does um, cross many sectors. Uh, so, uh, and there's, but, but it also is a lot of part-time that are supplementing incomes. So I think what's, what's interesting is you could look at the jobs that people are in, or you could look at who are these workers in general? Who are these part-time workers? And that tells you a lot about who would be directly impacted by a change in the minimum wage. And before I get to that though, I wanna make sure people understand this increase in the wage is, um, it, it includes what the pay increase was going to be in previous uh, previous legislation that was passed. So if we stay on the path that we're on, we're still going to have a minimum wage increase, and that's been lost in the discussion in the State House. So if we do nothing, there is still going to be an increase. The difference will be by 2024, 
will be at $12.04 an, an hour by 2024. And with the new bill, if it passes and gets signed into law, we will be at $15 by 2024. So it's, it's a pretty slow in, incremental climb. But who are these workers? So 56% of these workers are women. Many of them are the heads of their households. I know we often say that these are teen workers, but 90% of the people who will be impacted by this are 20 or older. So most of them are not teen workers. Many of them are not part-time. And Jim talked a little bit about the, the tipped wage. Women are the majority of the, um, both the minimum wage and the tipped wage workers. And I don't think we'll probably get to have time to even delve into the tipped wage part, but right now, tipped wage in Vermont is only half of what um, the regular minimum wage is. And so that is gonna be an issue that we also are gonna be investigating. I don't know if we'll make any legislative recommendations on the tipped wage, but we know that when women are overwhelmingly in any line of work, they tend to be less paid than the men. And so we see this with the tip wage as well. Women are o the overwhelming members of the tip wage class, and they are also experiencing much higher rates of sexual harassment on the job than in other lines of work. Part of that, we believe, is because they rely on their tips to supplement their income, and so they are dependent on those tips and put up with more at work because they feel they need to in order to bring home the pay. So it's just another nuance I wanted to bring into the discussion that we really haven't given a lot of attention to in the State House yet. Thank you very much. Um, John Grosvenor is here. I don't know if you want to ask your question, but that's the first question on my list. So did you want to pose it? Oh, um, sure. Um, well, I've got a bunch of questions, but as, uh, as I registered Great. Well, thank you, John. Um, I, I think if there was a question in there, and it was where would we be now if, um, if if minimum wage had been indexed from the beginning, and I don't know the answer to that question. Do you guys know? Um, I'll take a, a quick stab at it, but it will be in broad brush. Um, you can always pick um, numbers in the. I mean, minimum wage dates back a long, long time, and you can pick the when it started to where it was now and, and maybe we're ahead of that or even with it. You can also pick a time in between, let's just say, you know, 1975 and then go forward and maybe it's uh, less than what it would have been there just with, um, uh, with CPI. Uh, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, a couple things. Vermont has the six, currently six highest, I think, minimum wage in the country. 
we can't lose sight of that because we're not necessarily operating in a, in a bubble. Um, additionally, um, if you look at 2014 to 2017, uh, when you know, 2014 was the last time that the legislature actually set in a schedule as opposed to CPI. And that wage, I think, went up like 14.5% in those three years. Uh, wages in Vermont over those same three years, uh, median wages only increased uh, 6.5%. So uh, just increasing um, beyond what inflation would have been does not necessarily mean that wages, overall wages, uh, increase at the same rate. So it's something we just have to be cognizant of. We need to look at all the impacts. Uh, we don't have a magic wand in Montpelier where we can just say everything's going to be good, uh, everybody's going to be fat and happy uh, because um, there are a number of factors in the marketplace. So to your first question, my understanding is if it had increased uh, peg to uh, inflation rate of growth that we would be at a $20 an hour minimum wage in order to have the same buying power that someone had uh, in 1973, I think it is. And so right now, if, if you look back at where it was adjusted for inflation in the early 70s, it was about just over $10 in terms of buying power. And right now, we're just over $10, but we don't have the same buying power. So it's. Some of this is, uh, as Jim said, it's, it's hard to peg down the numbers, but we know it has not, <clears throat> it has not grown uh, to the extent to which we are where we were in the 1970s. Another way to measure that is um, minimum wage today is much farther away from middle class wages. So looking at 1968, so I looked at the year I was born, so I turned 50 this year, and so I was thinking, where, where was it in the year I was born? So Minimum wage jobs and, and the, the, the proceeds from that made up 50% of the share of the, the national wages um, for full-time, um, full-year median wage. Today, it's only about a third, right? So if you just look at what, what people were making contributing to national wage, it made up about 50%, and now it's only a third. Your second question was, what's the impact for workers on the ground? Right, and, and this, of course, this is, this is what I care about in, uh, when I'm out talking to constituents, when I have people email me and call me and say, I can't make it work, I can't make the numbers work, but I'm also concerned, am I gonna lose hours at my job? Is my job gonna be eliminated? There are a lot, so one thing that you should know is this is the most studied economic issue ever. And so we have a lot of data. Some of it's conflicting, but most of it generally, you can pull out uh, themes and threads. And one is, although there might be loss of some uh, jobs, often they're, they're part-time jobs, and people pick up uh, those hours at another job. And what we find is, when you look at studies of this, because like I said, it's the most studied, if you look at places that have increased the minimum wage, if people lose hours at a particular job, they tend to pick it up at another job and they make up for it over the, the course of the year and they end out, uh, end up the year ahead. So does this, does this make it easy for employers? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that this is easy. It's going to take adjustment. It's going to take um, hard work and sacrifice. I understand that, but my lens, I get sent here to Montpelier to do work by my constituents who are struggling to make ends meet. And so when I look at the data, when I delve into it, I think on the whole, it makes more sense to move to this than to not. <laughs> Sorry, I just happened to be on the way with the microphone. <laughs> and, and sometimes I need to. <laughs> we, as I said before, we have to look at ramifications. We have to be cognizant of it. Uh, and maybe I am super sensitive to it because of my past life. Uh, country stores are near and dear to me. Uh, we're losing them for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of which is increased costs that the state puts on them. 
Um, we talk about conflicting studies. Um, we don't have a lot of data on the new world of $15 uh, sound bites for minimum wage. Um, Seattle is probably the closest, um, and the uh, study by the University of Washington um, indicated that in the first nine months, when they went to $13, uh, they, there was a reduction of nine, 9.4% in hours at the lower end. So we just, we have to be cognizant of that. And Seattle uh, is a much more urban world with a lot more economic activity going on uh, than probably our entire state. So we just need to um, beware of implications. And uh, I would get back to, I mean, even our joint fiscal office uh, and our economists, uh, Tom Cavett, when he looked at this, at the request of the legislature, he talked about a reduction in jobs at 15, even on the phase-in schedule, was going to be 2,200, 2,800 uh, positions uh, statewide. So again, um, there's a fine balancing act, and I, as I said before, I can be pragmatic and work with anyone for an outcome, uh, but I don't want to just vote for something because it seems like a politically popular thing to do and do more harm than good at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, I've got to ask some questions now. So, <laughs> so I, I, I think, you know, uh, Vermonters are really uh, pragmatic and a lot of the questions we have are all about the law of unintended consequences. So let's just dive right in. Uh, Mike Rogers from Colchester says, School districts outside of teachers employ a variety of workers who may not make that $15 minimum wage. Accelerating this m movement, will the legislature recognize the additional pressure it will place on school budgets and the increases that will occur on property taxes and be understanding of that domino effect? So I, I hand that one to you, Becca. So before his, his past life, retail grocer, my past life working in schools. And so certainly as a former teacher, as a parent now of two kids in the public schools in Brattleboro, I certainly understand you pull one thread, you're, it's, you're gonna feel it in another place. I understand that. I think what's hard about this issue is we in state government or local government often feel the need to uh, push the envelope to tell other people what to do. Right, that we should be more virtuous, that we should increase wages, and we ourselves are not willing to do that on the ground where it is, in schools, in school budgets, in state government. I understand you know, this is gonna impact state government workers as well. And so, will we be sensitive? I can't speak to my colleagues. I certainly understand what it is to try to pass a local school budget and to take care of the people on the ground taking care of our kids, but what kind of, state do we want to have? What kind of community do we want to have? Do we want people working in our schools who are making a poverty wage? That is my question. Do you want paraprofessionals who do a lot of the frontline work with kids not making a livable wage? I don't. So is it going to make for some very difficult decisions at the local level? Absolutely. And I want to just say, because I know I couldn't take the, the, the microphone back before, in terms of job loss, just want to say, a lot of the job loss is not full-time equivalents. It's, it's part-time work, and I think that's important to keep in mind. So to your, to your question, Anne, are we aware that it's going to have impacts beyond the, the, the market sector? Is it gonna impact our schools and our workers there? Absolutely, but I feel strongly that this is work that needs to be done. It's not my question. Oh, okay. It's my reader's question. Your reader's question. Thank you for the clarification. Mike from Colchester. Yes. yes. Thank you. None of the rest of the questions are from me. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, to, the, to this point. So, so uh, Mike Rogers wanted to know what the impact basically is going to be for school districts who need to pay $15 an hour, who might be par paying paraprofessionals or cafeteria workers or school bus drivers or custodians less than $15 an hour. And you know, there the, another person here. Um, while we're on this tr topic, because it's all in the same vein, um, Teresa Wood from Waterbury wants to know what impact this could have 
Um, uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to find her exact question here. Um, she wanted to know what the potential impact might be on things like um, on, on groups like mental health workers. Um, in this case, what would the impact on services for people with disabilities and older Vermonters be? So, you know, are there school budget implications for local property taxpayers and then uh, implications for um, the state increasing wages or the designated agencies in some cases. You know, have we run the numbers? Do we know what the cost would be if we if we did this? I don't have the uh, pleasure of serving on the Appropriations Committee when we look at all the various state budgets, but uh, our own Rutland County uh, Visiting Nurse Association uh, talked to the Rutland County legislators uh, this past fall and they indicated you know, they're, they're heavily dependent on state funding through Medicaid, heavily dependent. And as much as they would also like to just increase wages to the 15 and beyond, um, the budget implication was $300,000 a year. Uh, and the message to us was, if you wanna do that, and you think that's the best public policy, we need another $300,000 in an appropriation. So you have to um, look at that, not only Rutland, but other counties and what's the escalating effect. And it, that's just one segment. It, 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 uh, the mental health uh, agency had a similar message. Uh, I don't believe they gave us a hard and fast number, um, but um, there are escalating. And it's, sometimes it's not just bringing you know, the, the unskilled uh, entry level position to 15 that is an impact, it's bringing everybody else up that was making 15 or 16 that's experienced and trained. Uh, they need to go up, uh, otherwise you have, uh, you know, just a, you know, no, no incentive to, uh, for them to stay and um, earn the same as elsewhere. So it's, it's very difficult, there is budgetary implications. Um, there's budgetary implications in the current environment as uh, there's a work shortage, for it, but we just have to be very, very careful and tread light. Thank you. Uh, on the flip side, Ken Kaddish from Colchester wants to know, what do you predict the amount of increased state income tax revenue will be generated by a $15 minimum wage compared to today's income tax budget projection? And will this increased tax income be dedicated for any specific uses? So I think these questions are really pointing up that this is a much more complex issue than the rhetoric that we hear from both sides. So what would the state income tax revenue implications be? Becca, do you know? I don't, I didn't bring those figures. Yeah, oh, okay. I, d I didn't bring those figures. Jim, do you have those on you? Um, I can certainly get them to post later to yeah, your website because we do have the analysis from joint fiscal. I, did, oh, I had to choose my, from my packet. Um, yeah, no and one thing if I could, because I thought Jim brought up an excellent point of the home health aides and the LNAs, and one other piece uh, that we heard in testimony last week was that in addition to um, the, the lower wages they pay, uh, that they, would, they, they all say we would like to be able to pay more. These are really hard jobs. They have a 40% 40% turnover rate, and we discussed in committee, what would it look like for you to pay more, have less of a turnover rate, and not have to do all of the training that you have to do, all the costs associated with the retraining of people when you have a turnover rate that high. So there's a lot, a lot that we don't know, but certainly we are taking testimony on both sides uh, of the building and both the House and Senate on these issues. This is not, uh, Sometimes the way it's portrayed in uh, the, the news is that it's a slam dunk because we did it, we passed it last year, and we're still going back again to, to get the updated numbers to see what it looks like today because those numbers are now two years old. So I just want to reassure people that we're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, just on the tax issue, uh, a number of folks would also uh, argue, and, and perhaps successfully, that. Um, we all want to help those on the uh, low end uh, and try to do what we can. And it may be, uh, from a government standpoint, earned income tax credit uh, is much more targeted. 
Um, it's not targeted at the part-time high school student uh, supplementing their allowance or um, college savings or what have you. It's, uh, it, 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 it's targeting the people who are trying to raise families and need help. So uh, it's something you know we should consider and look at. Um, Vermont's been good in this area, but we could do more. Thank you. We have a specific question from Jean Rindle from Manchester Center. She wants to know, will high school students also get $15 an hour? As people aware of economic factors know, a high minimum wage will cause inflation. How will inflation affect people on fixed incomes and low income people? Will the middle class be able to afford food if milk and bread starts costing $8 and $9 a gallon? So we've got two sets of questions there. One is specifically, um, will high school students get $15 an hour, followed by, you know, what would the ripple effect be for consumers? Um, so, Becca, you want to start? So the, so the bill is still in committee and is still being worked on, but this is an issue that we're, um, we took up last time, we'll take up again. As it currently is, um, high school workers would not be paid at the same rate. As, as other workers under this bill. So that's, and that is, we haven't landed yet, but that is certainly part of uh, the complexity of the issue related to um, the employment scene uh, among the, our, our retailers in, in Vermont and who, who are those workers. So that's the first piece. What was the? Uh, the second piece was Oh, the, prices, prices, yeah, yes. The inflation, potential inflation. Right, and so again, when you look at the data, which, which you know, I, I'm, I'm a geek, I'm a history major, I love the footnotes, I delved into um, the, the studies again this weekend, and, and really what seems to be sort of the, the consensus of what increase in cost of goods that we'll see, it's basically 0.3% to 1.5%. And I'm not saying that's insignificant, it's not. If you're on a fixed income, any increase can be significant, but it's not, we're not looking at $8 for a gallon of gas or a loaf of bread, okay. as, as she said, based on past experience and study. Great, thank you. So in, in terms of the students, current Vermont law exempts high school students from the minimum wage. Uh, they have to pay the federal, which is 725. Um, what's interesting to note though, in the marketplace, high school students are today are typically paid minimum wage of Vermont's minimum wage or higher. Uh, and quite frankly, it's the marketplace. Um, they, if you're looking for, and I, <laughs> listen, I, I, I started out, I, I'll date myself. Um, uh, I'm not as young as uh, the senator here, uh, but uh, when I started out, minimum wage was like 160 or 165. You're I, I, I am, I'm sorry, <laughs> full disclosure. Um, and, and I was thrilled to death. One of the jobs I took paid 174 to start. I thought it was bagging groceries, as, as you might expect. And I was pretty darn good at it. And maybe after a few months, I got a raise to 180. And I was really pleased. I thought I was something. Um, that, so um, it's, it, it, it's difficult. So whatever the bar we set, you know, unfortunately, for those that perhaps don't need that kind of wage, um, we're, we're, they're probably going to go along with it uh, because of the marketplace. Uh, it, just like I said before of the inflation on the other end. What's very interesting to me is it gets back to the economic activity in an area. New Hampshire is one of those states that have not changed from the federal. Their minimum wage is 725 today. We're at, what are we, 1078 uh, right now. It goes up with inflation. Their median wage is higher than Vermont. So again, it's the economic activity. Uh, there's a lot of more, perhaps, opportunity, especially in southern New Hampshire. Uh, but even in areas like the Upper River, Upper River Valley, um, there's a lot going on in New Hampshire side. So. Um, the minimum wage it may not have the impact uh, that we think it does. And in fact, you could argue that perhaps Vermont, with the sixth highest minimum wage in the country today, has the 21st 
highest medium wage. Uh, so it's not a silver bullet uh, and magic answer. Thank you. Um, Cecil Foster from Bristol wants to know about the Seattle uh, reports. There have been mixed findings of the results of the raising of the minimum wage in Seattle. Which report do you accept, and why have you chosen to accept that particular report? Jim, we'll start with you. Well, as, as I mentioned before, and I haven't studied this like the committees of jurisdiction have, and I'm sure they've heard those conflicting reports. The University of Washington did probably the first study on Seattle, and again, Seattle may be important in that it was the first one to go up. And it was a quicker. Uh, uh, right, and they were at 13, I think, a, at least a year ago. Uh, um, so um, that's important in that regard, uh, but it's also important that it's so different than you know what we are in Vermont. So the University of Washington indicated that 9.4% reduction um, in positions or hours, I guess maybe, um, for, for the low skilled or no skilled entry level positions. Um, I don't know since then uh, if that's changed, but we also need to remind ourselves there are a lot of variables in terms of economic activity. Um, I don't wanna get off track, but sometimes I, I look and presidents, both parties, pat themselves on the back when the economy was doing good, that they somehow had something to do with it, and they get the blame. They get the blame when the economy's not doing well, and I would suggest that both uh, claims are overrated because the economy is uh, moving independently for a variety of reasons. So it's a great question. The Seattle study is one that confounds a lot of people because you can find uh, very strong arguments on either side of the debate looking at the results of that, that same um, situation in Seattle. So what I chose to do is to put aside Seattle because it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't a strong indicator either way. So what I like to do is look at more meta-analyses. So let's look at studies of studies and what, what do we find when we aggregate. So two that I like to look at, um, Stanley and de Couliagas, uh was a 2009 study. So it was a meta-analysis of studies of minimum wage. And it looked at many, many um, areas that had minimum wage increases. And they looked at, does it have a depressing effect in, in those areas on employment? And the meta-analysis shows that in fact, with like a couple outliers at either end of the graph, most of them are right dead in the middle, meaning it did not have a negative impact. So looking at the aggregate. The other one that did a similar thing was a 2010 study of 300 contiguous counties across the country. So counties that in increased minimum wage that were bordered by a county that did not increase minimum wage. And it was a similar finding of these 3,000 border study uh, analyses. What they found was, again, no significant depression of either uh, wages or employment in those areas. Now again, we're gonna keep looking. We're gonna keep delving into the data to see um, you know, what are the threads that we can pull out. And as Jim said, there's, there are many factors involved in employment and wages, and it's, the minimum wage is one part of it. But I feel secure when I look at the meta-analysis of what has happened. I feel like the, the thinking over time has changed about um, the impact that minimum wage has on local economy. Thank you. So we're almost out of time. Um, I want to respect everyone's time here, um, including our guests. So it's 8.53. I think we have time for one more. Is that all right? OK. So this is from Dave Wagner of South Burlington, and this picks up on something John Grogner was saying earlier about um, his friend who works at Kinney Drugs. Um, how will you keep employers from cutting hours workers work at the $15 hourly wage who formerly were working 40 hours at the $10 hourly wage? A related question that was in the list here has to do with um, the impact on benefits that um, certain people might not qualify for if they were paid more. So Jim, we'll start with you and uh, finish with Becca, and this will be our last question. Do I get to intercept the mic coming back for the, <laughs> for the last word? <laughs> so, 
Um, a, a good question. The short answer is uh, you, you, we don't know how the impacts would be. Um, I think uh, uh, we have to be uh, cognizant of that. Um, we have to be careful. Uh, there can be a reduction in hours. At the end of the day, a business doesn't do anybody any good, um, not themselves, not their employees, if they're out of business. So they need to uh, try to do what they can to balance prices, uh, balance the needs of their employees, to make sure they're attracting good employees, and sometimes that means paying a premium, and that's the marketplace. So they have to be very cognizant of it. But what employers are also very nervous about is we, meaning legislators, across the, um, the way here, um, think sometimes we know the answer. And we don't always know the right answer. Uh, and let me just give you a, a quick example of that. Um, this year, our legislative leaders have already announced plans for a new mandated family leave program. Well-intentioned, um, valuable benefit, um, but it's a nearly 1% payroll tax funded by the employer and the employee. Um, so you take that um, by itself. We do sometimes work on things in a silo, and it says, that's a great benefit. I know it's a cost, but the benefits may outweigh the cost um, from uh, many perspective. But then on top of that, we say, well, that's not enough. So we need to go to a $15 minimum wage. We have to be very cognizant of the impacts. So um, we want to all want people to earn more. We want opportunities for all of our citizens. Um, we just have to be careful of how we do it. And we don't always know best. So one thing I think we all need to keep in mind is we have a citizen legislature. We are not professionals. I have no staff. Even as majority leader, I have no staff. I am one person of a body of 30 in a larger body of 180. And I, I bring that up because I go home every weekend to my little neighborhood in Brattleboro. And I'm out in my yard, stacking my wood, trimming my lawn, and people in my neighborhood know where I am, and they come and talk to me about what's important to them. And so we are not professional. So do we often make some mistakes along the way? Do we not always get it right? Absolutely, because we are you, and you are us. So I wanna, I wanna remind folks of that. That said, what do I hear overwhelmingly from my constituents? I need to earn more money. I cannot make it work. I'm working as hard as I can. I can't support my children. And to the, to the benefits issue, which is, is such a great question, which is, are employers going to have to trim on benefits in order to pay for a wage increase? That's going to be for those employers to decide. I'm not going to say what's right for a business. I do know that when I talk to my constituent, constituents, Overwhelmingly, they want more take-home pay. They want to decide how that money is spent. Will that be true across the board? I'm sure not. I'm sure there are going to be some instances when they feel like they're losing a benefit that they enjoyed. But I have to kind of distill the information that I get from my constituents, and what I'm hearing is I need to make more money. Thanks, Ann. Thank you. Do you want to grab <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is a really complex issue that will be playing out uh, over the months to come. And uh, we'll be, um, we're already talking about doing a major data analysis because I think the answers are really unclear and uh, the data is mixed. And so I think the more data sets we can get out there for people to evaluate, the easier we'll be able to see um, what's most beneficial for everyone, which is a hard thing, right? That's the thing we struggle with as a democracy figuring out what's a benefit to the public on, on the whole. So thank you all for coming.